Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer, parents. Nikki Kinzer, hello. <laughs> hello, Parent Pete. <laughs> parent Pete. That, that has a ring to it. Just lock in the like alliteration. It. Yeah. Uh, today, we're talking <laughs> about parenting our our teens, our teens, <sighs> our teens or our teens uh, with uh, ADHD. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, leaning in on some of the best parent jokes, I'm I'm not sure. Are we talking about parenting teens who have ADHD themselves, or parenting teens while we have ADHD, or all <laughs> of the above? Everybody, all if ADHD, of the above, because we have both here. Yeah, that's right. right. We that's have right. both We're covering, scenarios. That's actually out, grammatically outstanding that we can yes. cover the bases with little to no uh, editorial. Uh, Really, influence. it's true. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's really great. What? Why are we doing this today? Are you usually? I when you and I come together for a podcast and we don't have a guest and it's a topic like this, it's usually because one of us is is must be dealing with something. <laughs> are we always? <laughs> <laughs> with teenagers, you're dealing with something every day. Come yeah. on, let's be honest. Yeah. That's the truth. That's the truth. Yes. Well, uh, it, it is uh, for as we record this, at least for me, it is the challenging uh, season of closing out the dorm. And so dealing with my older teen, who also next week won't be a teen anymore, which blows my mind. Uh, and yeah, so, that's crazy. Um, you know, we're all dealing with the n- navigating complex schedules and understanding behaviors and all of those things that that don't ever seem to go completely away. Have you noticed that? You, yes. ADHD is always there, always oh, watching. Yes. Always it watching. Is. That's what we're talking about today. Before we do that, head over to TakeControlADHD.com and get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list and we'll send you an email each time a new episode is released. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Pinterest at Take Control ADHD. But if you really, really want to connect with us, join us at the ADHD Discord community. It is super easy to jump into the general community chat channel. You just visit TakeControlADHD.com slash Discord, and it'll whisk you over to the actual invite for Discord so that you can log in. But if you are looking for a little bit more, particularly if this show has ever touched you or helped you understand your relationship with ADHD in a new way, we invite you to support the show directly through Patreon. Patreon is listener-supported podcasting for us. With a few dollars a month, you can help guarantee that we continue to grow this show, add new features, and invest more heavily in our community. Just visit patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast to learn more. Thank you to new members. As we record this, it is June 1st, and uh, we're heading into our summer season. Is it officially summer? For a lot of people, it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's officially because summer. Because a lot we'll of people, yeah, summer. school ends in May, and here over in the Pacific Northwest, it will end in a couple of weeks. So. Yeah, we've got a couple more weeks. So we're heading into our summer season, and uh, we're just excited about all the new things that are coming. Do you have any news or announcements yourself? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, so they're coming. coming. Uh, If you were a patron, you would have just recently received episode four of our patron-only podcast, Placeholder, in which I uh, talked to one of our fantastic community members uh, about uh, his use of technology and his tech stack in academics. And it's a fantastic conversation with a truly uh, awesome, awesome guy. And so uh, I'm just having a ball with that podcast. And I'm, I'm gratified that uh, people at least seem to be listening to it and appreciating some of the insights that we're all sharing on that show. And I would love for uh, to introduce it to more future patrons. So uh, head over to patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast to learn more. Uh, we're talking about parenting today, uh, parenting kids with ADHD, uh, and uh, where do we even begin with this? I I'm looking at our no notes, idea. and we've got, <laughs> we've we got some. We have so many notes. <laughs> <laughs> so all people out there that are uh, parenting teens with ADHD, we feel you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's hard. Um, yeah. I You know, I brought this topic up because it's something that you and I um, both are are a part of. I have a teenage daughter who has ADHD. You have two kids who have ADHD. Mm-hmm. And uh, my older son doesn't have ADHD, but he has other issues with anxiety and uh, depression and some other things. I think COVID 
certainly has not helped these kids. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in the three years that they've had to be teenagers and, and, uh, deal with the chaos of the world. Um, so I just think there's a lot to, that we can talk about. And, uh, you know, this is not a conversation where really Pete and I are not expert parenting people. <laughs> We're just two parents in the world trying to survive. <laughs> so I thought uh, we, you know, have a focus a little bit on parenting in this kind of themed or uh, yeah. what do I want to call it? The kind of series. The, the series. Thank you. That's the word I was forgetting. And uh, I thought, you know, it might be interesting to hear what Pete has to say and talk a little bit about my experience as well. Because Lord knows my kids aren't interested in what I have to say. So I need an outlet. Yeah, mine aren't either. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> That's the moral. I, no, so yeah, I, I think you should. I think you should start because I'm really interested in your uh, your perspective and reflection on your teens now, especially now that we're wrapping up, you know, one of their freshman year and the mm -hmm. other is in is wrapping she's up. She's a sophomore. She's yeah, wrapping up so her sophomore year. Yeah. Freshman uh, year in college and sophomore in high school. I, it's been a while since we've talked about uh, our kids from the perspective of parenting. And I'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. what reflections you have on on your experience over the last year as they continue to uh, weirdly continue to grow and mature. Right. It's like a roller coaster. Um, there's moments where I am so proud and I love them so much. And, and that doesn't ever change. Um, but I see them as becoming adults. So we're having different kinds of conversations than we did before, especially with my son, because he's not um, living with us all the time. So there's moments where I'm like, yeah, I did this right. Like I, you know, my husband and I, we did okay. These kids are amazing. And then there's times where I'm just really frustrated because I forget that, you know, they are young adults and they don't know a lot. And what we kind of assume that they should know, they don't necessarily know. And so that gets to be frustrating. Um, and you know, there's been, a little bit of a difference. I mean, every kid is always different, right? I mean, that's, I think, true for most families. You never mm -hmm. see two siblings that are the same. Um, but with my son, he doesn't talk a lot. And so when he does want to talk, oh, we listen. Like we sit, mm -hmm. you know, we drop everything and listen because he, he, he just doesn't open up that much. My daughter talks a lot. And so, um, she will kind of give us insights of what's going on in her life and what she's dealing with. And I got to tell you, when we're talking about sort of like strategies and tips, when it comes to parenting, one of the things that has helped us the most, especially with her, is when she wants to talk, we listen and we ask questions but we avoid telling her what to do at all costs. Mm -hmm. Because if we try to fix it, she absolutely hates that. She hates it and she'll get defensive and she'll shut down almost immediately. Interesting. And so you think that is, uh, I mean, that's just an indicator of where she is emotionally right now, chronologically, hormonally, all of the onlys. <laughs> I'm going to guess it is, right? Because yeah. you're in this like middle ground of I'm a teenager. She's 16, almost 17, and she's going to be a junior next year. So she's a little bit older than most of the kids in her class. And so here she is, you know, still depending on mom and dad, um, still lives with us, still goes to high school. But yet she has also a lot of freedom and trying to kind of learn who she is because she works, she has her own car. Um, you know, she's very independent in a lot of ways. And so I think it's this, this, yeah, emotional roller coaster for her too, that I want independence, but yet I don't, cause I'm not quite ready for it. But if mom and dad step in, it feels too controlling. And sure. so then she's defensive. And then, you know, you also have to look at when I explained to her what RSD was, she just was like, oh my gosh, that's yes. I feel mm -hmm. that way all the time. 
So I also have to take into account that, that, you know, she feels things really heavily. So if she thinks we're trying to fix something because she's not doing it, or if, if she, if she feels like she's being criticized at all, then she really shuts down and and gets mad at us. Mm -hmm. And it is so hard not to take it personally. Um, Yeah, I believe it. You know, because I can see what's happening, but I can't necessarily explain it to her. And it hurts my feelings, even though I, you know, it, 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 it's, we had a conversation just the other day and we're talking about our school and her, you know, my husband and I are completely doing this out of love and trying to figure out where she is and what she wants to do. Cause she's, she is doing online school now and does she continue doing that or not? And the whole conversation just ended up being really quite sad because she kind of felt like we were ganging up on her and that she, we, she felt like we weren't thinking she was doing the best that she can. And I'm sorry, I'm not good enough. I mean, there were all these like back and forth where when we take a step back as parents, that's not where we were standing at all. We just wanted to gather information from her and try to figure out where she's at. And is this the best thing for her? And it's all coming from love from us and concern, but she sees it as us being against her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and some of that is like, if I think back to my to to my own sort of teenage years and mm-hmm. like it, it it's pretty easy to remember the times when i believed my parents were disappointed or judging or you know ready to punish me or for some you know it's just easy to put myself in that headspace like i i remember it really clearly and now looking back on it as a parent myself i'm i'm realizing what was probably true then that they didn't care half as much about the thing itself as they wanted me to care about it for myself. Right. And like, like if I was not doing well in history class, they were less upset that I got a D on the last, you know, paper that I turned in than that I was only, you know, worried about that D because I thought everybody was mad at me. Right. They they wanted me to worry about the D because they wanted me to want to learn and, right. and, and all of that. It's like that that misappropriated intention. And um, and so I, I try to remember that when I'm when I'm talking mm-hmm. to my kids. And I don't know. I mean, everything that I'm hearing right there, I can put myself in in her shoes and, totally. and just think about, oh, my God, I can. I'm sure my parents are thinking X and mm-hmm. they're not right. Like. <laughs> largely right. the kids are not right about what I'm really thinking. Um, and they're, they've just misappropriated that intention. And I think from my perspective, all of these tips really fall into the same kind of uh, parent category, which is um, beware of letting my experience with ADHD run headlong into conflict with my instinct as a parent. And uh, I'll tell you what I mean, just in one example, like I know for me that it takes me some time to rev up my brain and I know I need to start by doing something fun. We've talked about this all the time. I need to establish some Mm -hmm. momentum in my productivity, right? Before I do something hard, we don't eat the frog with ADHD, right? right? We we work up to the frog. And so... As, as somebody living with ADHD, that's very real for me personally. Then why, as a parent, does that should step into my inner voice when I see my son doing exactly the same thing? Right? So when you see your son doing the same thing, are you thinking that's okay? No, I'm or not. I'm no, thinking you should thinking, be. No, you, you should, should be, be put, doing this. put away that thing yeah. and do this other thing because you got to yeah. get it out of the way. And that's right. it's not that I don't. As the words are coming out of my yeah. mouth, I know that they are misguided. As it, and, but it is so hard. It is a constant vigilance to mm-hmm. keep my parent language from running headlong into my ADHD language. And I, I don't know yeah. if I'm alone. I, my no, hunch is not. I'm not. You're not because even from my perspective, and it's interesting that you bring this up because I think that from our last conversation, when she was saying that she wasn't good enough, me as an ADHD coach, that crushed me. Yeah. And so it is really hard, I think, to 
balance that. And I don't know where the balance is between, you know, I really understand how, what she's saying. And I understand that this, how she's feeling with this, but at the same time, like you're saying, I am still her parent and I still need to help her and guide her. And what she thinks is the best thing for her. I want to hear it, Mm -hmm. but I also need to be her parent. Yeah. And, and not just, you know, say, okay, well, this is, it's okay. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a very complicated, but it's, it's hard. It's a hard thing to do because right. I don't want her to have those feelings, but at the same time, I don't know what the best thing is for her right now either. Yeah. So yeah. does well, that make sense? It, it, well, it does make sense. I think but I, I think this is it leads into one of my uh, other sort of lessons, which is the overestimation of traditional achievement as a measure of success when yes. you're parenting a kiddo with ADHD. Yes. That uh, it, you know, I'm proud of my kids when they get A's and B's. I mm-hmm. have to be mm-hmm. equally proud of them when they get C's, right? I have to right. be equally proud of them when they figure out how to actually finish their homework and turn it in. That the traditional, I'm only proud of you when you get A's and B's, or you will be rewarded with your license, or a, yeah. you know, we'll get we'll get you a car, we'll pay your insurance, whatever those kinds of traditional rewards are, um, uh, are not useful. Right, <laughs> right, right. Those right. those kind that that framework is not useful with my kiddo with ADHD, and and um, I am I run into this one all the time, which is. My this was especially true with my daughter when she was still living here um, was. You have something that you have to do and and Mm -hmm. you you need to get it done. And it's not because of me. It's an assignment. It's a paper. It's a test, whatever it is. And it would just sort of naturally slip into a model of as soon as you finish that thing, we can go do this other thing. We can go out to eat. We can go to a movie. We can do this thing. And maybe I wasn't even intentionally using it as a reward, right? It just became that way because of the schedule or the time the movie started or whatever. And she would go into this space of just complete doom that as soon as Mm. she knew there was a reward tied to her performance, she just said, okay, I'm not going to the movie. I guess I'm done. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm done. And I'm, I'll probably fail this thing. And so I, I think that, you know, we've, we have talked extensively in and around the show on black and white thinking, right? That binary right. thinking. And I think that's, that's where we're going with it. I'm curious your thoughts because. Yeah, you're right. It, it really is. It She's is. Like, <laughs> if, if there's an if then statement in there that if this exists as a reward, I have such a low opinion of myself, then I'll never get that reward. So I might as well just like yeah. not do it at all. And yeah. I see the same kind of thing start to happen with my son as he now has more opportunity for doing fun things now that he and mm-hmm. his his friends are gathering again. And, and those opportunities are tied to his own implicit shame about not having a high opinion of himself to be able to do stuff. So mm-hmm. uh, I, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's interesting because I can totally see the all or nothing thinking in the example that you just gave. But I can also see it with the example that I was talking about with our conversation around school is that it is probably in her mind, you either go or you don't go. And if I don't go, I have to go back here. Or like she is really going black and white. There is no discussion to be made, which is where we were trying to head. And so, yeah, I can see that definitely. And it's actually, you know, I'm glad you bring it up because I think it's something that we need to be aware of as parents, that that's probably what's happening and why it feels so dramatic. Like Paige is dramatic. Like, yeah. Um, you know, and I have to be really careful to not fall into that same drama <laughs> and be able to take a step back and, you know, uh, just listen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I see this with her friends. Like she'll, she'll sometimes talk about like social situations and as everyone knows and remembers being a teenager, social, you know, social relationships are really important. And, um, I have to be careful to not really say much because next week that person that she's upset with could be her best friend again. Yeah. 
Right. So I need to like, okay, just listen. And if it's something that really goes over the top, then I might, <laughs> I might have a couple of things to say, but, um, but it is interesting. Yeah. I think that, that thinking we have to really definitely be a part, you know, a part of, or be aware of, I mean. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and I think, you know, my, my next observation was don't let my ADHD color my impression of their ADHD. Right. And, and I think I could say by, and uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I usually loathe in speaking for you, but I think I can probably say don't let my anxiety color their experience, color their, my impression of their anxiety, right? Like it's yeah. the same, it's the same thing. Don't let the stuff I'm living with color my expectations of the stuff they're living with because it is very different. Every time I turn around, it's it different. Some, I'm learning something new. Sometimes I'm learning something new about my own ADHD by observing their experience with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm just, you know, learning something new about them. Um, right. And and so I, I think, you know, as a when I started uh, freelancing, I was always I, I was given this uh, guideline on uh, estimating time, which was and, and in this case, it's it's about billable time, which is take how much time you think it'll take you to do a thing, uh, you know, a long project or something, then double it and then uh, double it again. <laughs> and that's what you should right. submit as your estimate, right? Totally, yes. You just never know. And and I think that holds for my expectations of their ability to do a thing living with their own experience of ADHD. Take the time I need to get ready to do that thing or to change contexts between events or get ready for school or whatever, and then double it for my expectation of them, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. So that I give them a cushion in my mental model of their experience with life. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. that and and that really, I mean, you could redefine that as just grace. Give them grace. Give them the right. same grace that I want my inner head voice, you know, anxiety ridden, imposter syndrome head voice to give me, mm -hmm. and start there. And that mm -hmm. sometimes gives me a a break against the the um, that ADHD experience versus parenting should right. talk. Right. Well, and I know like the should talk, like even. Um, keeping in mind like when her room is messy which you know is quite often mm -hmm. it, it, you can't just say oh you need to go clean your room right <laughs> because that is overwhelming and so it's something to remember like okay give her very clear instructions on you know sort of teaching her how to do it so that when she is on her own, I mean, we're teaching them how to be adults, right? So, you know, uh, you're, you're hoping that she'll get the skills that, okay, well, take out the trash first, take down the dirty dishes, you know, sort the laundry. Okay. Like giving her the skills of where to start mm -hmm. in the room and kind of going through that with her, you know, while she's still home, I think is really beneficial. And, you know, one of the things she does, cause she's um, vegan is she does her own grocery shopping. And I noticed when I cleaned out the refrigerator the other day, she has like four bottles of vegan ranch dressing. Oh Yeah. Oh, and, she likes to pound those when you're not uh, looking. Yeah, yeah. none of them are open down yet. <laughs> a bottle of vegan ranch dressing. Yeah. yeah, but it was kind of that teachable moment of, hey, you know, this is what I noticed. And before you go grocery shopping, it just, it's a good idea to do kind of a quick inventory of what you yeah. already have. Yeah. and and write down kind of what you need and you know you you try to make it a teachable moment like this mm -hmm. is something you need to learn because it's not something that comes naturally I mean you don't remember if you have ranch dressing right. and you really want it so you're gonna buy it and now you have four of them so you know I had this um, I had this funny experience just this weekend as an aside where um, my wife uh, Kira she uh, has just moved her desk around and she has a lot of stuff just kind of on the floor in piles and she's like I need to I, I need to put it on some shelves or some sort of bins or something like that and she said I I went to uh, I, I was at Target getting something else and I saw these bins and I thought I'm gonna go buy a bunch of bins and said uh, said she said then my head voice kicked in and it was like wait a minute Nikki told you to always do an inventory before you go to storables and buy the bins that's true and she and that was from our early organizing podcast yes days. And yes. this is the same thing, right? Always do the inventory before you go shopping for the stuff. And I looked at her and I was like, I can't believe that lesson is still with you in Nikki's voice. That was 12 years ago. <laughs> 
like you're, at least I have a better sense of where your specific damage is right now. Yes, no kidding. not really internalized that lesson. I thought that was really funny. Uh, uh, that's but, great. but yeah, I mean, it's that it, it is so true. It's that countering that impulsivity vibe, right? That mm-hmm. That's like I go shopping. I shop vegan. I see vegan ranch dressing. I buy it because that equation solves itself. Right. 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 Um, so, yes, yes. Um, OK, how are you at tackling big, big transitions like with your kids? And I, I'm asking that just because I know you also just went through it with your mm-hmm. son who is wrapping up his freshman year. Mm-hmm. Right. What was the as he was an older teen, what was his experience going through the the college prep process? Well, he told us a couple of weeks ago um, we w- went out of town for a wedding and and so we were all four together and um he told us a couple of weeks ago at this wedding that he admits now that he wasn't quite ready he it, college was a little bit more than he expected it to be mm-hmm. and it was harder than he thought and he thought he was going to have everything under control and he realized that it's a lot harder when you're on your own Um, you know, to make sure you get up and go to class and all of those things. And, um, so he does see that there was a learning curve, you know, obviously during that time, um, you know, it's tough. I think it's really hard. Those transitions are difficult. And there are things that I know that my husband and I sort of assumed that he should know, but I don't think he did know. Um, and then there were things that he did know, Um, But he had to learn the hard way, you know, because there wasn't anything that we could do to help him. For example, in his first semester, he or trimester, because they go through trimesters, he failed a class. Mm -hmm. Well, he thought he had he thought he had time to withdraw from the class so that it wouldn't go into his GPA. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't. I mean, he had missed the deadline. And that's something that you know, he should be on top of, like, I'm not looking at when you can withdraw or pass or drop classes. He's in college and I'm thinking he's doing it. He's getting that information. He really didn't know. Okay. Well, you don't know, but the consequence is now you have an F that's going to decrease your, your GPA and you're going to have to take that class again and you're going to have to pay for it because I'm not paying for it twice. That's not fair to me. And, you know, so he had to learn that the hard way. And you know what? The lesson didn't exactly get uh, into his head because then now going into the third trimester, he's failing another class, didn't withdraw from it Mm -hmm. and is going to have to take that again in the summer. There are hard lessons here, people. Hard lessons. Like this is yeah. not an easy thing. And, um, you know, well, trying to navigate all of that, it's tough. Really tough. And I, I asked that knowing that your son doesn't have a, a ADHD diagnosis and that, that was, you know, the process looks different than it will likely look for your daughter. Has that influenced the way you talk about or think about going into the college search for for your daughter? Well, it does to an extent, like, I think that she's going to let me be more a part of her experience where um, my son was very standoffish. I'm an adult. I can do this. I don't need your help. Mm -hmm. So you can only offer so much help before you just stand back and say, okay, we're here if you need us. And, you know, but I think with her, she's going to be a lot more accepting to, I don't get this. Can you help me figure it out? Yeah, yeah. So it is going to be, a, I think, a different experience, although she's still going to stumble and fall mm-hmm. too, because, you know, it it is just, it's life. We all do, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that transition from going from high school to college, especially with somebody with ADHD is really hard. Yeah. Um, but I've also told her that I'm not going to make her you know, take 16 credits. She only needs to take 12. Like, you know, and I said the same thing to my son too. Like, I would rather you have less classes and do well and feel Mm -hmm. comfortable with your load than to try to make up these classes at the end. You know, like you can go to summer school. We can, you know, go into a fifth year if we need to. Like, I'm not 
pressuring them to get it done in four years. And we offered a gap year too. Like we, we've we told both kids, if you're not ready to go to school, and I said this tons of times, so many times with my son, especially after COVID, because he didn't have a senior year, right. everything was online. And so I'm like, if you want to take a gap year and just kind of wait and see like how things play out with COVID and if you go back to school in person or whatever. No, he wanted to go back. So that was the decision he made. So it's just hard because it's like you want them to to make these decisions and you want them to fly. And it's really difficult to sit back and, you know, when do you step in and when don't you? Right, right. Well, and I think just in terms of of that process in particular, you know, we were in a, a similar space, though, when COVID hit and everything shut down, my daughter was in her senior year. So she didn't have a like her after March, she didn't have a graduation. She didn't have a prom. Like she's one of the kids that lost kind of the end of her senior year. Yeah. But the process I thought was interesting because we really struggled to get her to engage in that. It was too out of sight, out of mind, like too far in advance Mm -hmm. for, for her to even imagine college. Like she was just kind of wrapping her head around, like, I have a summer job, like, that I'm right. going go, to go. That's what I need to that focus out. on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we had to, we had to really create some pomp and circumstance around it. And that was a process that really worked for us, that there was a hard thing. We created meetings where mm-hmm. the three of us, my wife and, and my daughter and I sat down and we each had, uh, we had an official agenda. My wife was the agenda keeper because, you know, it's what it's who she is. Yeah, it's what and she does. <laughs> my daughter would take attendance and we would all say, I here present. And we would have checklists and things. And I was usually responsible for bringing snacks nice. because uh, it, my daughter thought that my wife would bring healthy snacks and I would always bring ice cream. And nice. <laughs> so like we each had a role, but that role softened the blow into the hard things, which was let's look at our schedule and figure out when we're going to be able to hit the road and tour some colleges. Let's look at the application deadlines and figure out when we need to sit down and actually break down these, the essay, essay writing process and the common app and do all of the things and break them down into very small pieces, right? They're atomic components yeah, so right. that we can get them done. But we had to create the show of the board meeting in right, order to right. soften the blow of the actual work that needed to get done. And for, I, I think for both my daughter and me who were struggling with that transition from mm-hmm. different sides, um, that was really useful. So being able to create a mechanism of theatrics that actually demonstrated, uh, you know, how we were going to do this hard thing, how we were going to eat this particular elephant right. um, was incredibly helpful for us. And it took a long time to get there. But you can be sure that we are prepping the binder for my yes. son, who is oh, yes. you know, going into his junior year and um, and figure that out. Well, it's helpful to kind of know that you're doing it uh, like once you get the first one done, it feels a little less scary for the second one, because now we know the process where like with the first one, everything's changed so much since we've been in school that, you know, it, it was all very new and foreign and lots of due dates and lots of things to keep track of. And, um, so I feel a little just more prepared myself going in, you know, than, Before. Let's um, uh, let's take a step back because this is just our experience with the, right. with big transitions. That's really big. You put your coach hat on a little bit and you take a step back to the earlier teenage years uh, and and I guess your coach parent hat. How did you know it was it, it was time or what did you watch out for? What did you find in your daughter that recognized it was it was time for an assessment that your your kiddo would benefit from an assessment? For ADHD? ADHD, yeah. Well, she actually, so she was, it was right at the beginning of eighth grade. And if you think about it, that is right at the time, eighth grade, here in Oregon anyway, eighth grade is still middle school. And then you're going into high school, right? So in eighth grade, they're prepping you to go into high school. So the academic responsibility as an eighth grader is a little bit more difficult, right? right? Because they're trying to prep you and get you ready. So it's not, it's not so easy. And, uh, and you have all the social things that are happening at Mm -hmm. that time too. 
But she was the one that actually came downstairs one day and said, I took an ADHD test and I think I have ADHD. Okay. She she led the way. Yeah. So she how, led the way. I wonder way. how normal that is. Did you ever do you ever get a sense for how often it is that the kiddo is coming to you and saying, I think I've got something going on? I don't think it's very common. Yeah. I think it's probably because, you know, she has been around ADHD so much with with me in my business and and has heard me talk about it and has listened to the podcast before. And sure. I think she just um you know, I don't know what it was inside of her that realized that something wasn't quite right. I can tell you what the, what happened that made her take that test. And that was when she was um, studying with a friend and they were doing a homework assignment and the assignment only took her friend 20 minutes to do. And she was still working on it. And she's like, it would have taken me at least two hours to do. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of the first thing that she noticed that something wasn't quite right. Now, I, with this information and you start digging and I ask her like, well, how do you organize your papers at school? Like, what does your binder look like? And I see this binder with just a bunch of, you know, papers shoved into it. There's no cat, you know, she's not using the dividers that we bought at the beginning of the year. <laughs> there is no like, this is homework. Everything is just shoved in there. And I'm like, huh, okay, red flag. Yeah, I, got a, um, <laughs> I, got a, I got an idea. I got some ideas. Yeah, yeah. So it all sort of came together. Uh, I don't think it's very common. But I do think that um, if I do think if you're a parent, if you have ADHD yourself, it's not going to be a big surprise if one of your kids have it. So right. it is something to be aware of. Like if you start noticing red flags and you start seeing these things and they're just a little too familiar. Sure. You know, then there might be something more to it than. Yeah. Than well, and I think that. this is one of the angles I was kind of going at here that, that, that just sort of hits me that you and I both might be predisposed to either hyper diagnose or under diagnose in our own heads, the relationship with our kids and ADHD, that me because there is such a huge part of me that no matter what is constantly saying, God, please, I hope they don't, they don't have to deal with their brains the way I have to deal with my brains. I hope it I hope everything is easier for them than it was for me. And you because you live in this world where you're coaching and working with people every day who are living with ADHD, that maybe we might be incented to to either not see those traits or only see those traits in our own mm -hmm. kids. Um, and I've always worried about that on my end, that I would be, I would be either, you know, too ignorant of their experience or too focused on it. And both of those are dangerous, right? The too focused mm -hmm. on it can really damage my relationship with my kids, right? It's just like all I see is the hard stuff if if I go into that place. You know, all I see is late assignments, is homework that's not turned in, is late for school, is late getting out of bed, is like all of the things that I know I struggle with. It's so, it, they're all just so easy for me to, to project onto my kids. And then under diagnosing, I miss the fact that they are late for school, late to turn assignments in, late getting out of bed, all of those things. And then I'm not in a place to help. Mm -hmm. So it's a, that's a constant struggle. Yes, I think, you know, it is interesting because I think that one of the one of the things that I wrote in my notes about this was to recognize when you notice that uh, they're doing something that, you know, would be hard. So like if I notice her doing her own laundry, I want to praise her and I want her to, you know, I want her to, I want to say, Hey, that's awesome. You're getting your clothes cleaned. You know, you're getting this done. Like that's a chore that many people don't like to do. Right. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think that there's a balance between not always seeing, you don't want to always see just the symptoms, but it's interesting because the doctor, when she originally went to get diagnosed, we went to her primary care doctor and they dismissed the diagnosis because they thought I was too close to the situation because of what I did for a living. There you go. Yeah. And I didn't think that was fair. I was very angry about that because why would I want this for her? Like, I don't, I'm not going to make this stuff up. I mean, this isn't the, you know, let's just look at the facts. The facts are, these are the things that she's struggling with. 
this is, you know, it fits into ADHD regardless of what I do or don't do, yeah. you know? And so I didn't accept that because I knew there was more to it. And that's when we decided, okay, well, we're going to a psychologist who specializes in ADHD, who specifically tests for ADHD, not just a, a questionnaire you know, mm -hmm. that I'm filling out and their teacher is filling out. And of course, you know, it did come back what we suspected it to come back. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, I think that there's a lot of understanding too. So there's sort of this, like, it's not, it, you can always tell when she has come through the kitchen <laughs> and I chuckle because it's like, that's all you can really do is just sort of make light of it. Like, yep, Paige was here. She made her dinner. You know, she made her lunch, whatever. Like she had breakfast this morning. That's fantastic. <laughs> you know, um, but I, you know, what's so interesting is that I was watching, um, I have Mel Robbins as on one of my Instagram things. I follow her and she's, mm -hmm. a, you know, she's an inspirational speaker and she's just really, I think, cool. And she has ADHD. And she wrote a little post this morning that said, this is what ADHD looks like. And she walks out into her driveway and she has both car doors open and her trunk door open. And she said, it's been like this for two hours. I totally <laughs> forgot that I didn't shut the doors of my car. So she yeah. goes and she shuts the first door and she said, oh, the second door was open because I was unloading groceries. She, you know, she <laughs> shuts that door. She shuts, shuts the trunk and she's like, yeah, that's what it's like. And she, but then she says, you know, you just have to, it, it's okay. It's okay that our brain is different. It's okay that this happens. You know, you have to just um, accept it and you know, in this situation, you're light with it. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of how I look at that. It's like, yeah, she was here. Um, now if it's a bigger problem, like she's left the stove on before and yes. that's a bigger problem. And so that is, uh, that's definitely something to say, Hey, just make sure the stove is off. Like, yeah. If you do you one thing to do that, just yeah. one thing, make sure yeah. it's this thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I the the last thing I have as we kind of get to wrapping up, and this last thing that I had on my notes was was just talking a little bit about um, you know some things that I I got from Casey that we've talked about before, mm -hmm. um, but you inspire me with the car door story that that in in my case cleanliness is not a moral judgment and yes. neither really is forgetfulness right like no i agree all of those 100%. things they're not moral judgments they don't make the the kiddo a, a bad person they don't mean they they are also not an indicator of their trajectory in life um at all and so you know it's easy to to project and see the doom and gloom that could happen if the only thing your kid does is leave stoves on in every room that they every kitchen they ever go into <laughs> for the rest of their lives it's so easy to say that and equally ridiculous they're gonna right. be okay yes yes absolutely so yeah you got you got anything else hot on your list no, I mean, you know, it's it's a it's a roller coaster, like I said, right? There's ups yeah. and downs, and and um, you know, we're all trying to get through it together. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. The more I think, you, the more you say that, the better off you'll be, right? The more you yeah. say we're in it together. This we're, is in the it thing. Together. we're in it together. And it they're in does... it with us. You know, yeah, this they're is in not... it too. Yeah, th we don't all have to agree at any given mm -hmm. point. Right. There no. are three different opinions that uh, about these things. And we just have to make the case uh, for for strategies, for support yep. when it is warranted, when it is welcome and when it is not. So exactly. Uh, well, thanks for this. A little bit of a, a departure from our recent uh, episode. But I always appreciate these more thoughtful discussions with you, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this very show. We sure appreciate it. Welcome to June. Welcome to summer, uh, and thank you for your time and your attention. And don't forget, if you have something to contribute to this conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel in our Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Mm -hmm.